Hi, everyone, and welcome to Imbibe Live Online, supported by Mezcal Sentia. I'm Liam Scandrup, Spirits Business Development Manager at WSET, and we're bringing this session to you in collaboration with WSET School London and the Industry Matters series we've been hosting with Imbibe since last year's Imbibe Live. The last few months have been the most challenging time for our industry, and today we'll be discussing what's in store for hospitality over the next six to 12 or 18 months. We've all bought our crystal balls, right? To help me do that are Lyndon Higginson, founder of the Lions Club, and many other great bars in Manchester and London. Drew Mallins, founder of the London Bartender Association, and Anna Sebastian, bar manager of the Artesian at the Langham Hotel. Would you all like to take a few seconds to introduce yourselves, starting with you, Anna? Well, hi everyone, and um, thank you so much for having me um, today. And um, really nice to be part of this initiative and you know seeing that continuing to see imbibe um carry on during this time um my name is anna i'm the bar manager at the artesian bar at the langham hotel in london um worked in hotels probably for the last 10 years um had my fair share of dive bars and nightclubs before that um which i really really loved um and that's pretty much now that brings me up to now obviously with lockdown sort of happening um being swapping at the sort of five star bars for uh parks which i've really enjoyed as well we should probably give an honorable mention to your great work with the skywalker cocktail for under one sky thank you i drank a couple of those this weekend and they're delicious and it's an amazing call thank you so much um yeah just on that it's um during this time i've been um, volunteering for a charity called under one sky which um, basically we go out every single night and feed the homeless, sometimes up to sort of three, 400 people every single night. Um, one of the most sort of prominent things was the, um, the amount of hospitality people that we met um, that had lost their jobs and lost their homes and lost their sort of support, um, support network due to what's obviously been happening. Um, so that kind of really spurred myself and another volunteer, um, Sam from Metro Pubs, um, sort of create this cocktail to raise awareness and um, money to go to the charity of integrate people, um, to help integrate people back and to give them that small back. So yeah, have a look, it's called Skywalker Cocktail. So there's a website you can buy them from there if you like, um, and especially if you like drinking and enjoy doing something good as well. Lyndon? Oh, sorry. Um, hi. Yeah, sorry. Hi, I'm Lyndon Higginson. Um, um, I've got sort of, how many bars? 14 places now, sort of uh, mainly in Manchester, uh, but Leeds, Liverpool, um, London, and Oxford as well. Um, so as you can imagine, these last few months have been kind of slightly weird, scary, uh, and everything in between that. Um, We've sort of got over 400 staff over all the sites. So, you know, getting our staff safe and and making sure that we've kind of got, uh, they've got jobs to go back to as well, you know, um, which, you know, does lead us all the way up to sort of what we're going to be talking about today. And, you know, is there an industry left? Is there, you know, are we going to have to change everything? Do we sort of wait all these things out? Who knows? Uh, I mean, I, I don't think any of us know here, but I think we can have our best uh, guess predictions. Um, I, I guess some of my places will be more difficult. I think the Artesian, I would like to own the Artesian right now just for the bar element of it because, you know, Jesus, I always want to stand up in there, but you're not allowed on, on any day anyway. So um, it's a lot different if you've got uh, kind of a dive bar when your capacity is normally 200 and you've got like, for knackered, smelly, crappy seats. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be interesting, to say the least, to try and get these things uh, up to what we wanted them to be and sort of seeing where, I guess, seeing where sort of everything lies with the customers and if they're going to want to come out and uh, go to a dive bar and a party bar when they're sat down uh, rather than propping the bar up and it's 10 deep at the bar. So, yeah, let's work it out in this hour. Let's do it. Yeah. Drew? Hi, guys. Thanks, Liam. Uh, my name is Drew Mallins. Uh, I run the London Bartenders Association. Uh, There's a Facebook group that's been uh, that's just over 10 years old, uh, about 30,000 members, uh, and has been really key for getting information out. Um, 
and asking questions to uh, to the uh, most of the London community, but there's a, there's a global audience uh, on there as well. Uh, as operationally, my, my experience is mostly in uh, in, in bars and uh, restaurants, most notably Hakkasan and Lab Bar. For the past couple of years, I've been working for myself, so uh, doing various bits of consultancy. Uh, most recently, for these wonderful people at the Drinks Trust. Um, if you are unsure who they are, go check them out. Uh, drinkstrust.org.uk. They are the drinks industry charity. Um, they've been working tirelessly over the past few months uh, to get various services and initiatives out there for the industry, uh, in including raising money, focusing things on me mental health, uh, and, and a smattering uh, of other things. Uh, and thank you to uh, Imbibe and WCT for the invite for this. Uh, lots of news coming in sort of by the minute, by the hour of, over the past few days. Hopefully we can sort of digest it all. Uh, and get the right advice out to people because there's lots of questions um, that have come about since the uh, rather vague guidelines uh, from the yeah. government. So hopefully we can give some reassurance, some good guidance to people because we've only got five days until uh, the 4th of July. So uh, uh, thanks for watching, guys, for those uh, those that are. And um, I look forward to having a chat for the next 54 minutes or so. Yeah, we'll get to that, as you say, rather vague guidance that came out on the 23rd of June. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions from the audience. Um, there's a panel at the side for audience questions, so please drop your questions in there and we'll look to get through them throughout the discussion or at the end. I've also been told to put in a disclaimer. There may, we may well be some swears in this hour, um, particularly from Linda. <laughs> I'll try my best. <laughs> so we'll just get started then. Um, firstly, a kind of broad question about the government's handling of the crisis. There's been a lot of debate around that uh, and their support for business. The job retention scheme was a lifeline for many hospitality businesses and staff, uh, but that's set to change in August uh, and end in October. We talk of a reduction in VAT and a lot of support for the national timeout campaign spearheaded by Jonathan Downey. What more would you like to see the government do? And Anna, um, we'll, oh, go on, sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll start with, we'll, well, I was gonna start with Anna, but if you wanna, Start, Lyndon. You're welcome. No, Anna, please, ladies first. Um, yeah, I, like you said, it's been like the news is changing so quickly and so often. Um, so for us, we've really been taking one day, one day at a time and trying not to think too much into the future at the moment. But at the same, same time, time, trying to put things in place to in order to sort of start to sort of reopen as well. Um, I think looking at the bigger picture, I think it goes back to, you know, hospitality has always been one of the industries that have, have been, been hit the hardest. hardest. Um, it's considered by the government, you know, an unskilled sort of industry. And I think that's where the issue sort of starts, you know. So I think I definitely like, you know, putting obviously what's happening right now aside, I definitely like the government starts, you know, putting things in place for us to have like more stable, more secure, um, better pay as well, better sort of minimum wage and everything as well. Um, but also for them to sort of invest in hospitality and sort of treat it as a proper job. You know, I'm sure we've all been told, oh, when are you going to go and get a proper job? And it's just, you know, it's one of the oldest industries in the world. It's something that everybody associates with. Everybody enjoys going to pubs and bars and restaurants and everything. And I think first and foremost, as soon as the government starts taking that industry seriously, then we can start actually dealing with the problems right now. Um, so I think, uh, you know, right now, I'd definitely like to sort of, I'd like the government to sort of look at, first of all, the, the travel ban, the quarantine as well. I think, I think that's, that's gonna have, have a huge, huge significant impact, impact on our industry. We just physically can't operate. You know, people are not coming to this country it's it's such a huge proportion so for me that would be one of the most kind of pressing sort of things is to lift this travel ban and of course we need to be safe and you know we need to make sure that you know we follow processes and everything but the, the travel, travel industry, industry which is the hospitality industry, industry is just not going to survive, survive if, if this, this doesn't, doesn't start opening up significantly especially to some of the biggest, biggest travel markets, markets in the world, world. So, so I think, I think that's, that's one of the things, things that, that you know, especially coming working in hotels, it's one of the things that I would really like to see the government sort of focus on as well. I think some of those travel corridors might help alleviate some of that, at least for the short term. Yeah, I think um, I think definitely it's we're, we're going to struggle. You know, if that doesn't change, I think we will sort of struggle quite significantly, not just short term, but also long term. You know, I know I said that we're thinking very much in the sort of present and day to day, but also if things don't, it's going to have such a huge knock on effect for the future of hospitality, of bars and everything as well. 
Lyndon, have you been happy with how the government has handled all this and how they've supported you? I mean, I wouldn't want that job um, at all. I, I don't think any of us would. I think, um, without going too far into it, I think, I think they've done a reasonably good job. And, uh, you know, things like uh, the 80% furlough and, and, and things like that have been great. Um, and we want to survive about it. So, you know, um, I, I'm not overly sure where my allegiances lie, uh, lie politically, and maybe this isn't the time to go for it. But, um, you know, I think Labour probably wouldn't have done uh, as much <laughs> as 80 percent. Who knows? Uh, and I, yeah. Uh, but I guess, you know, you touched on it, Drew, as well, that the sort of the not knowing is, has been kind of uh, really, really difficult for us. And, um, and you know, there's quite a lot of information out there for uh, for employees. Um, there's, I think there's been considerably less for employers. And uh, I've got employees asking me questions nonstop. And I'm like, when I know, I can tell you. And, and that's, that's a really horrible thing to have to say to your, to your employer, uh, employees when, you know, we should be getting this information and you know, a lot more in advance. I know it's been difficult. I know it's been a long slog to try and get some sort of happy, well, nobody's going to be happy, are they? Um, you know, it, it's, it's been difficult. Uh, I wouldn't want that job. And this right now, we've got kind of, you know, when, once they said the 4th of July, we've had 11 days realistically to pretty much change all of our businesses as as we know them um you know there are some places where they might have you know certain restaurants have got they're socially distanced anyway the tables are they can pretty much operate as normal and then there's other places you know where, where this is just brand new to people and i think being able to do that also whilst thinking in your mind that you have to have you know we've got a duty of care to our staff and to our customers and you know I'm not overly confident that opening on the 4th of July is the best idea. I'm not overly confident that this virus has gone away. Um, you know, there's still people dying on a daily basis. And we're now almost, all of us a, bit, a little bit, are kind of ignoring that a little bit because we're like, shit, we've got our open on Saturday. And we've got to make sure our staff are okay and our, and our customers are okay. That's a really, really difficult thing because it's very conflicting, um, you know, realistically i think you know we, we we open as we should fully when everything's gone away but who knows when that is drew anything to add here um not a huge amount but i, I certainly agree with much of what uh linda was saying there certainly in terms of information for owners and operators uh, it's certainly a lot vaguer for them uh, than it is for for employees and obviously that does make it difficult with, with conversations when you're trying to give information to your employees but if you haven't got the answers you haven't got the answers um uh, and it's really important that clear information is put out there both for for employees and both for guests moving forward it's certainly on uh, on saturday I, I totally agree i think it's a little bit perhaps too early to open and open on a saturday um i think given the uh uh, uh given the protests as well where we had mass gatherings uh it's uh you know would have been good to perhaps see another week just to see if there was an effect on that um but you know that we they closed the bars and pubs on a friday night and they're reopening them on a saturday so i mean that's that's one one small part of uh, a, a bigger problem um uh but ultimately to be slightly fair to the government i'm, I'm fairly critical of them uh, over all of this but to be fairly, fairly fair to them it, they've had to make it up as they go along um uh, essentially, we can follow some uh, examples, some and learn some lessons from other countries. Like the talk earlier at eleven o'clock um, covered that they had operators that already open from from other countries, and I've been chatting to people uh, as well uh, overseas to see what they've been going through uh, and what lessons we can learn. Because I think that's the most important thing we can do now. Uh, you know, we can't just sit here and wait for all these government details to to materialize because they're not going to i think we need to look at what other people are doing work together as a community communicate am amongst each uh, each other um uh, and although you know we're businesses are naturally competitive i think now is the time to really share ideas and and support each other um within within communities within cities and towns you mentioned some other markets and other countries that are maybe slightly further ahead of us than uh, on the curve yeah. Is there any specifics that you think we can learn from? 
Yeah, so uh, to give a couple of examples, so uh, there's an Imbibe article by Neil Hamilton uh, that I saw this morning. Uh, so he spoke to a few people in, in Australia. I think he's out there himself. Uh, yeah. uh, he's a, a writer. Um, they were uh, the obviously you've got the different states of, of Australia. I think we're focused on sort of New South Wales, so you, Sydney and Melbourne as well, uh, where they were quite strict on rules. So I think you had to serve food with your alcohol. Obviously, you had to be seated, uh, and there were. Um, uh local councils governments just checking you adhering to to the laws so they were they were very strict on the open they didn't from what i've read they didn't have any direct increase in covid cases from hospitality what they found it was more people having barbecues and and um, gatherings at home um because that's one of my fears is that we see a spike in, in line with opening and hospitality and then the finger starts getting pointed at, at the hospitality industry so we've got to be quite wary and very careful uh, of, the, of the first for those few days, first week uh, of opening, um, to avoid that. I think, yeah, essentially, being the, the stricter the better. Yeah. Um, there's certainly been some loosening of licensing conditions across Europe in places like Berlin and Vilnius and things like that. I think we're going to need to see similar local authorities being quite lenient in the early stages, right? There needs to be trust at all levels and understanding mm -hmm. from those enforcement officers that everybody's making it up as they go along to some extent everybody's having to adapt to this very unusual situation is that something you're encountering Lyndon with your local authorities yeah uh, I mean I've been sort of speaking to them quite closely about all the things especially with sort of outside spaces or the lack of outside spaces on, on certain venues and um, you know to the most part especially in Manchester um, it, they've been they've been pretty good. They 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 realise that you know normally it takes twenty eight days to change things or, or whatever. And, you know that that's you know that's just ridiculous. Uh, I mean it's ridiculous the best of the time. It's certainly ridiculous now. Um, so you know we've had pretty much a go ahead for most of our venues to have an extended outside area uh, which we'll be utilising. Um, and you know it's a case of like you say Drew as well about, about sharing as well. You know you don't want to be like you know, this is our area, this is in front of our place, and that's it, and you don't get to share it with us. So, you know, if there's places that can't quite use something, we're going to sort of share and have everything in place so we can do it socially distance, uh, everyone from each venue and our staff and everything. You know, it's it's a headache. It's, uh, you know, it's probably months of planning to try and condense that into a week as uh, interesting. Um, but for the most part... Um, the council have been pretty forthcoming with everything and it's pretty good and i think they've been for the first time working together um because you know they all they all have separate uh departments and no department speaks to each other uh the best of times from what i've learned um and they're now kind of going oh dave you work next door right okay let's do this so yeah things are things are looking quite promising for that um albeit you know th there's a lot of things that kind of aren't in place yet. We don't actually know if we can open places until 4 a.m. We don't even know if people want to be there until 4 a.m. Uh, and certainly with outside seating, do we have to bring that in? And we don't know that. And if, if you do need to bring it in, most places don't have a garage outside their uh, venue. So if you need to bring your seating inside, then you need to close your venue. So there's lots and lots of questions with no answers at the moment. Um, and that's just one thing with the outside seating. There's, I, I guess there's a lot more. There's also, there's also a lot of people sort of, you know, we, we've all seen it on Facebook and different things where people are asking questions and you'll see 10 different answers to the same question and they're all different. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, it does need somebody to kind of, you know, condense all of this down and go, this is our this is the, what the government is saying and that is a fact and that's it because they're changing that daily um we're going to that and going hang on no that it's this and then look look at it and they've changed it last night mm -hmm. so all of these things are kind of adding to the impossible task of making everything safe and friendly and fun and you know we want everything to be fun first and foremost and we want everyone to have a good time and we want to do that in a safe environment um you can't just have a safe environment because that would be boring as hell. <laughs> you know, you, you need to have both of these elements there. So um, that's going to be interesting. And did you start dealing with your risk assessments literally as that government 
stuff came out or were you starting to be were you able to think about that before the 23rd of june i mean we were yeah we were kind of we were kind of second guessing a few things but you know it's it's how much time have you got to second guess what's going to happen um until you're like well i'm just wasting my time now because that's not happening or they've changed that so certain bits bigger things we had in place with kind of plan a's b's c's and d's um and then other things we kind of waited and we were like we don't know fourth of july it was you know there was one thing the press said which never happened i can't remember what it was but maybe with the shot yeah it? and then and then the fourth of july so well we haven't been told this by the government so let's just uh they mentioned it in passing that it might everywhere might open if all of these things actually add up and we're, we're it's safe to open so yeah i think we kind of had to wait for that also you know all of our staff or most of our staff are on furlough so to the most part when you have somebody going can you just check this or do this or do these things you can't do that you can't unfurlow somebody unless you unfurlow them for three weeks obviously that's now changing uh on the first so you can have part time and and sort of you know make the most of this uh furlough scheme um uh, but you know you don't want to unfurlow somebody for one day um when it's yeah. you have to do it for three weeks and pay them for that on the furlough scheme do you think it needs to be extended it's unrealistic for the government to you know think places are going to be operating at 50 percent capacity but still able to pay their staff from october 30th. i mean yeah, I think, oh, sorry <laughs> um, I was just going to say on the on the furlough scheme, I think 100% it needs to be extended. You know, we're looking at business levels. So there's no, no way we're going to go back to you know, no being where, being where we were. were. In, you know, in I'm predicting, predicting that, that maybe, maybe September, September next, next year, year we're going to start, start seeing, seeing things, things be, be back, back to, to the business levels, levels that we used, used to. to. I, I think whilst the furlough scheme, scheme is great. great what we have to remember in hospitality is 99% of us work on service charge. And I saw one of the questions that came through earlier of 100% like service charge trump should have been included in the furlough scheme. And this is, again, a result of the hospitality industry not being taken seriously or given, you know, the respect that it deserves. Because, you know, majority of us, myself included, you know, we have a base and the rest of it is made up in service charge. So, you know, it's not so when you are taking 80% of your base, it's not a huge amount of money. Um, so 100%, yes, it needs to be extended. Um, I think it needs to be extended at least until minimum the end of the year, even going through into the first quarter. Because again, if there is another spike, and let's hope there's not, if there's another spike of this virus, and that comes in January, you know, it's, what are we going to do? You know, hospitality industry is made up of 2 million jobs. It's huge. It's not, uh, it annoys me so much that it's just not taken seriously like other industries are. Um, so yes, it needs to be extended. I think Trump 100% needs to be included. That way, A, you're saving jobs. You're saving an industry that every single person is sort of part of. Secondly, with the government, we need more We need more warning. You know, like Lyndon said, it's literally like a mad scramble to just suddenly just fix something, do risk assessments, do new steps of service. There was a few um, questions about service points. Of course, we're going to have to change everything. You know, are we wearing gloves? Are we not? Are we hand sanitizer? Like, all of these things. Also, on top of that is, you know, looking at our employees who are the most important asset of any business is what are they going through as well? You know, so again, preparing, you know, not just mentally, but we need to sort of invest in that. We need to have something in place. So when people do go back, that there is that support network for them, because, you know, drunk people at the best of times are a bit annoying but you know people coming back into your venue and stuff and yeah in hospitality we'll all respect each other and we get it and you know we're patient but you know not you know your average guest may not be like that so we need a support network and we need investment into getting people back because a lot of people in these three months you know wouldn't have seen anybody you know they live on their own or you know they've got high risk people around them or something like that so again integrating people back into what you know the hospitality industry and everyone keeps talking about this new this new normal you know it's um, we have to yeah exactly we have to invest in that and there's so many things and we need time to get back onto our feet and obviously we need to be safe we need to look after our teams um and we need to have a plan in place so if this does happen what do we do what do we do next time so that's what I want to see and be given that sort of time to do that as well. And, you know, with furlough and everything, it's like Linda said, it's great, but you can't go back. There's no point taking me or furlough if I'm not, if my bar's not going to open until September. 
sure. You know? yeah. So th there's so much stuff and I just don't know why nobody is asking the hospitality professionals for feedback and they're making decisions about an industry that they may have never even worked in or we'll don't even understand, understand properly. Maybe this is an opportunity to give some of those hospitality professionals a voice then and what some of the major points that are coming through to you, Drew, that their concerns are about going back to work. Um, well, I was asking that uh, this morning to to a few people um, uh, and the consensus I got is that the majority of staff uh, are more concerned about uh, their income than they are the virus going yeah. back to work, um, which... You know, I, I totally understand that, but um, that doesn't mean they don't care about the virus, but obviously everyone's got their own priorities. Um, but I think it's a, a reminder that of, of how strict we need to be for, for reopening. Um, you know, I don't I don't run a bar, but I, I would, you know, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't advise anyone to open on, on the 4th if they don't feel they're ready, or at least and their staff aren't ready. I think it's really important to have the confidence of your entire team that they've got the knowledge, they've got the training, they've got the equipment, et cetera. Um, to do that and to, to run the business successfully, because if if you mess it up for the first few few days or the fir first few services, it's going to potentially have a really detrimental effect longer term. Because if people see you're a venue not following the rules and and you're allowing guests to flout them, you know all it takes is is one is one photograph on social media or, or front page of a newspaper, and and we're all, almost back to square one. Um, but uh, you know, going back to, to furlough, uh, Anna, Anna makes a, a very valid point. You know, service, service charge uh, is, is taxed, and, and it's uh, it's bizarre that it wasn't included. Um, and a lot of staff do obviously rely on uh, service charge. Um, I mean, a slightly different argument. I mean, I'm just against the idea of, of service charge as, as a thing anyway. I'd like to see it removed completely and, and have the hospitality industry Pay, pay a decent wage anyway that's a different argument um uh but you know that's uh, that's part of the problems of, of having service charge uh, so so widely spread and people so reliant on it um uh but yeah the um just with in terms of questions that like staff are raising um it's just around uncertainty and not knowing where, where to get the right advice from and i think that stems what we're talking about earlier with Lyndon. it's you know sometimes employees haven't got the information sometimes information just uh, just isn't there so uh, I understand the nervousness, um, but we just need to keep communicating and, and keep calm uh, with everyone and, and work together. And I think collectively, certainly online, with the various Facebook groups and uh, uh, and other social media channels, I think we've done we've, we've been quite good at organising the right information. That there's a chat group for for the admins of these bar groups where we try and stem the right, the right information to to people uh, and showing things as they uh, as they come through. Yeah, you, you've done a sterling job sharing the information and proof checking a lot of things. As Lyndon said, there's always the answers to one question. So it's great to have yeah. a, a central source of truth, so to speak. Lyndon, on that safety point, have you been able to kind of liaise with your staff and bring them in um, to kind of the involvement of the risk assessments and kind of have them in, in input there? Um, we, we were actually doing all of that this week. Um, you know, again, it's sort of, um, we've, We've kind of kept our staff quite in the dark for all of this because, like I say, we didn't really have the answers. You know, it's like we we, we reassured them that we're there. We were reassured them that um, you know, pretty much. Well, not all my places are going to open on the fourth, um, and some places um, a lot longer after that. But people are aware when they were going to open. Um, we've just sort of said as much as we can, really. This week, knowing more, we can let them uh, sort of come in. But, you know, we're trying to keep staff in little bubbles as well. So, you know, if we're track and tracing different things like this, um, you know, if, if that happens and, you know, somebody somebody's in one bar, um, you know, I, I don't know how that works yet, but if somebody goes into one bar and they're close to people and, you know, does that mean that every single person in that bar is pretty much mean, needs to take two weeks off? Does it mean that our staff need to? And then if that's the case, then that's a whole venue closed down. Um, or, you know, it's at least... If you've got two bubbles, or a, a B team and an A team, or a red team and yellow team, um, nobody wants to be B team. Um, but um, I think if it's, it's really difficult um, to, to 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 know what's going to happen, uh, you know, uh, we we had a brief chat before this, and it is very much crystal ball and what's going to happen. We don't know. We we're all going to try our very best to make sure that everyone's safe, and if we do that then hopefully people are going to be able to come out and see the other side of this. And, you know, we need to get back to 
I don't want the, the new norm. I want I want I want yeah. the old one. Uh, you know, and I, I think everyone wants the old one. Um, but we're we're not going to get there if people are sort of doing the wrong thing. Like Anna said before about um, customers, and and you know if, if you know what do we do with with really drunken customers? I know when I get drunk, I I want to hug everyone. You know, I want to I want to have a good time, and I'm like this with my mates. And you know, you can't do that anymore. But after a few a few drinks or you know a few lovely cocktails you might your inhibitions go a little bit don't they so you know how do we police because what we've got to do is police this we've got to police it ourselves we've got to police inside outside and everything in between and you know we've not really got the tools to do that how you know how does a doorman so sort of stand a meter away from somebody who needs to be thrown out uh, and needs to be removed from a venue um i mean is the doorman going around? No, the venue, that would have happened, of course. Sorry. Is the venue going around? A, sorry, is the doorman going around the venue, separating people to ensure they're yeah. standing one meter apart? I mean, that's not in the in the nature of your bars, by any means. Yeah, exactly. And I think you know, um, you know, n none of my places will operate how, how, how they did previously um, un until we're allowed to. Um, and you know, that is again the customer. Um, uh, uh, you know, is that bar any good like that? Does that bar work? You know, it, it's kind of like um, certain bars will, certain restaurants will, certain bars won't. On a specific point about track and trace that you mentioned, have you worked out how you're going to be getting uh, guest data and that kind of thing and kind of passing that on to the authorities if needed? <laughs> Yes. Well, yeah, somebody has. Um, I, I, um, yeah, I think um, most of our things will happen through um, our app that you order with. Um, and, you know, again, all of this is kind of crazy, isn't it? You know, it, it's table service in a, in a dive bar is uh, the, the, the weirdest thing I've ever heard in my life. Um, but, you know, all information will be kept and, you know, you have to you have to keep your information for 21 days and then destroy it. And all of these different things are you know, added things to a already quite a stressful job of running a business and, uh, and you know, running a bar or a restaurant. Um, you know, your PPE, do people know? The PPE you have to save for, for so long and then dispose of afterwards and things like this. You know, it's like, so we need like three separate bins for this because you dispose of it after 72 hours. And, you know, all of these things to operate a venue, you're like, God, I've got to get all this into place. You know, there's no place to put three bins in most venues to be able to store any PPE. So, you know, people are having to adapt, and 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 we will. You know, every every operator and owner and and an employee will adapt and make things better because our industry has kind of thrives on things that are really really difficult half the time. I and mean, you know, we're kind of constantly herding cats um, on on a, on a daily or nightly basis. So we will make these things happen. It's just difficult to do it in 11 days yeah i mean just to reiterate some of that so i uh, was chatting to a good friend of mine uh jorge uh, balbonte who runs uh, a bar called um uh perdita in barcelona but he, he used to work in london uh and he's obviously open about two three weeks ago being in spain um and he had experiences of uh even friends industry peers coming in and getting too close and hugging and you know he got to one point where he in the interview uh, he says he had to stand on the bar top and shout at people to tell them to behave and follow the rules otherwise you'd have to close the bar um so you know we need to be strict but we've, we've got to obviously create a, hospi uh, a hospital environment but everyone's got to be uh, on board with it and be appreciative of of the changes and ultimately it's not going to be for that long if everyone just behaves for the next yeah. two three maybe four weeks and it's and hopefully cases start to go down then we can start to hopefully go back to, to the old normal and not have to put up with table service and dive bars which i completely agree with Lynn, that is really strange. <laughs> I, I think i think strange. that's a good point um about sort of getting back to that norm as well and and hopefully you know this is on its way out this is you know this is slowly changing and it's slowly going and and we're really, really responsible to 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 kind of make this happen. And yeah, the problem is with with uh, with all of that is you know, I think we all know what it's going to be like on Saturday when uh, when you're allowed to go out for a pint of Guinness or a pint of whatever. I'm desperate for a pint of Guinness. You it's know, be a show. yeah, yeah. So we just you know we just just need to control it. And if it takes having extra staff, I think to to control crowds and people and, and ensure people are following the, the rules and that that's. A, Ultimately, that's what it takes. And if people don't want to 
follow those rules and, and be safe, then they shouldn't really be welcoming the venues because they're not ready or mature enough to go out yet. Yeah, there needs to be individual responsibility mm. you know, and people have got to take it seriously for, for, for a short period maybe and hopefully just get us through this this little difficult time and then we can return to some kind of normality maybe in the first quarter of next year hopefully yeah I, th I, th I hope so as well and i think going back to you know somebody in the questions just mentioned it's you know why should that be the responsibility of the venue people hug and and i, I don't feel that it should be i i feel really strongly about like everybody was just saying about its individual responsibility as well you know everyone's got different views on the virus and you know social interaction and social distancing and that's fine but i think when you're coming into you know, the message that i'd love to get out is you know when you go out on saturday you know have that respect for the venue as well because if you know we if you know say for example we are artesian opens tomorrow and someone comes in all my friends come in and we're all hugging and you know that goes onto the front page of the daily mail because they love that sort of stuff it's get the the ramifications of that are going to be huge as well I mean, I don't particularly trust a lot of the just general public, you know, as we can see, you know, all the mess and the, all the beaches and everything. And so I just, I really, really hope that the hospitality industry will have the support of the people that we've been serving for the last, you know, collectively all of us have worked in bars for a good number of years that, you know, people come in and sort of respect that as well. But I think it's going to be interesting. We need to protect our staff. We need to protect, you know, the industry as well. And uh, hopefully come out of this sort of stronger and obviously not have another spike and everything as well um i think somebody just looking at one of the questions you know somebody said about if the government doesn't extend furlough you know the you know obviously huge restructuring in terms of sort of opening hours as well and um obviously if you're not having the revenue you can't operate as a business um and a huge amount of jobs are going to be at risk and we're starting to see that within the industry already um and it's it will be really really interesting to see you know if there are going to be jobs for people. Um, I hope there will be. I hope that this opportunity you know we mentioned earlier about you know re uh, new openings. I think we're going to start seeing quite a lot of as well. And um, I, I just hope that the government um, the government is is going to be able to sort of support this. And I hope that the job risk the job loss will be sort of minimal as well. Um, but it's a t it's it's a two way thing. I think we can only wait and see what happens next week with the sort of gradual reopenings as well should we move to the kind of next steps then and looking a little bit further forward and maybe with a hopeful positive mindset uh, although football footfall and revenue are obviously going to be down and some places are predicting by as much as 60 or 70 percent how do we think businesses can reduce costs to mitigate these losses uh, should margins be compromised or maximized who wants to take that one Go on, go on then. Um, it's a, I mean, it's a difficult question. Um, I mean, realistically, uh, I, I can only go on my sites, and you know, and and I've got various sites, obviously, uh, all, all slightly different. Um, and you know, to the most part, we are going to be capacity-wise at least fifty percent down. We're, we're probably like going to operate about forty percent capacity um, now. That obviously has a huge knock-on effect on um, what what's going to come out of that bar at the end, and and you know you you operate you have to operate and make profit, you know. Um, now, you, it we don't want to I don't want to lose any staff, you know. It, it, it's really difficult um, with this staff because maybe some staff can do less hours and you keep more staff on, um, but in doing that, you're going to essentially piss your staff off because you're giving them thirty hours a week rather than. 45 or or more you know especially if they're on hourly you know if they're on salary then that's great um but so so staff wise you want to keep all your staff but you're not going to have all of the stuff to do it's going to be a bit of a headache um you're obviously going to make 50 percent less or take 50 percent less than you were um so you know the, the the rent that you're paying is still exactly the same price uh the rates are staying the same everything is the same the cost of things are the same if not slightly higher uh with uh certain government things that have happened before all of this happened you know things things are prices of things are going up and we have to remember that we've got a huge amount of debt to be paying back 
um, when all of this is over. Um, and, you know, a lot of revenue and a lot of things that the government get are from, from things that we sell. So, you know, I'd love to see a reduction in tax on things uh, that we're selling so we can actually maximize profit. But I don't think they're going to do that. And I think it would be unrealistic to do that. Um, and do we want to make it £10 a pint? None of us do. But is that also something that potentially down the line will, will need to happen? You know, um, I, I honestly don't know how businesses are going to be able to carry on as they were, um, especially if their profit margins were kind of pretty low already. Um, that's where, and if, by the way, if anybody's got the answer to actually how to uh, maximize uh, the profit there and, uh, uh, and carry on as you were, I'd love the answer. I'm sure somebody will put it in the comments. <laughs> yeah. um, we're probably backtracking a little bit, but you mentioned rent as obviously a major outgoing for all venues. I'm assuming everybody supports the national timeout campaign and trying to put a pause on rent. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, somebody's asked an important question, I think, in the uh, in the What can bands do to help bars and the bar community in the coming weeks and months? Diageo, I know, have uh, announced a big pool of cash to uh, to help people with sanitization and things like that in venues. Is that what you'll be looking for from from brands and such that support you? Um, yeah, I mean. They had you release a bit, a bit at the start, didn't they? Um, which was really good. Um, how much is this one for? How many million? I couldn't say off the top of my right, head. Okay. The last price was uh, 100 million US, what was the last. Uh, right, figure. okay. I mean, 100 million sounds like a lot, but then divide that by how many bars there are. And, yeah. uh, and, and what is it? About 25 quid each? I don't know. Um, <laughs> It's. I mean, that's just me being horrible to Diageo there. It's yeah. Spectacular what they're doing. Uh, still want it, it, it. <laughs> it, 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 weirdly, that sounds like a huge amount of money, but split between every bar, it's yeah. nothing. Uh, we need a. We need a huge amount more than that. We need. We need everyone to do that. But then you look at people like Heineken, who are probably like the the biggest. Um, they, they've probably got the most beer sat in places at the moment, which is getting poured down drains. They've got a. You know, every business has suffered. So, you, you know, you kind of, on one hand, you kind of want help, but then you have to realize that they, they need help as well. You know, um, there's there's just a huge knock-on effect, and I don't know where it ends, really. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as uh, brand managers and account managers, they start to, uh, start to come off furlough, it's literally about having that conversation and, and just seeing what what. Uh, what they have to offer because they're not all going to have massive budgets like they used to. Um, you've obviously got various size companies. You've got your Diageos and Heinekens, and you've got your small independents as well. Um, but just uh, just try and be creative with with things if it's to do with offerings. If you're trying to maximise profitability, uh, and it, you know it's a really good opportunity to think outside the box. And you know adding things like takeaway, uh, keeping that on in certain markets in, in neighbourhood bars in, in cities where it's uh, where it's viable. As, you know that's a that's another uh, a, a conversation, I think, for the, the next talk on uh, or the previous talk on drinks. Uh, uh, but, um, yeah, that, I think there's still brands out there who really want to support the industry but don't quite know how they can do it. And I think it's just down to operators and, and managers to, to reach out to their, their account managers and just uh, see what they've got to say and, and just work on something. Yeah, I think also, you know, you touched on a really good point about, you know, there's very little – you know, how much can a brand have an impact on your business, you know? Um, but I think small things like, you know, menus are going to have to change from now on, you know, whether you it's all done on an app, whether it's disposable menus. So I think, you know, if they have the investment to do that, then that's a really, really good starting point. Or they have the investment to create an app for you. You know, yeah, a, lot a lot of people, people think, think that, for example, example hotels, hotels have huge budgets. budgets. We really don't. You know, it's you know, not only do we not, we have to get... A heap of signatures to sign off something very very small so having a brand sort of investing in a new type of menu i think would be would make a huge sort of difference as well especially you know then, then if you decide, decide to do takeaways or deliveries or something, or something like that, that actually, actually setting, setting something up or giving us a platform to be able to do that um because uh you know there's very apart from that i don't see how much impact they can have on keeping the business afloat keeping unless they're going to pay the next rent for the bar yeah. which isn't obviously going to happen and it's a ridiculous thing that'd to say that'd be, that'd be good <laughs> yeah um yeah. but in terms of offerings i think kind of 
obviously nobody wants to compromise what they offer in terms of like a certain style or certain quality of drink and I don't think we should have to I think kind of you know brands bring it but again it's like you can't ask a brand to bring down their price point because obviously they've had you know they it's not just bars or hospitality frontline staff that have suffered it's everybody so it, it's uh, such a hard sort of balance but um I'd be interested to see which brands will be sort of reaching out and starting that initial conversation as well. I think also people are going to be more careful about who they work with as well. Mm. I think tender deals are going to change completely. Um, for me personally, it's not just about, um, you know, the money, but it's about that sort of support, you know, when you actually needed something or you needed help, which brands kind of stood up and which brands sort of supported or supported those initiatives. So I think kind of supporting and working with brands that have values that are aligned with yours is, is going to be really important as well. I think actually one of the best ways hospitality venues can, can save money longer term is staff retention, which obviously the industry is notoriously bad at. Um, so that's certainly something to consider in terms of investing your staff, the sort of, the sort of training you're doing beyond just drinks and service. Uh, and I think now is quite a good opportunity for even for like junior staff to to let to open their eyes to what it is to run a business and to what it takes and you know show them show them your PL, show them your costs and and what the small things uh, the, the small changes people can make day to day just to, just to save those costs. And I, I think it, you know if we, we need to really start training a, a whole new generation of business orientated uh, bartenders and, and servers. Yeah, because there's not uh, there's not enough of that done. And, you know, we you know people have dreams to open open venues when they when they're young, starting out their their career, but very little have have formal training um, to do that. So I think it's a really good opportunity to invest in staff that way and really think outside the box and the sort of training you're offering that isn't just hospitality focused. Um, and look at things, you know, uh, various bits of tech that, that you can invest in staff to do mar marketing, social media training, photography, that kind of stuff. I think if, if bars and venues are, are really smart in, in how they invest in their stuff longer term, because we've got short, we're talking a lot about short term solutions here, but we need to focus on on longer term ones as well. And, you know, where, you know, where we're going to be in six, 12, uh, 18 months. And uh, Anna's saying earlier about back to normal September, I think that's that's fairly realistic based on based on information we've got at the moment. Obviously, a lot of it is down to getting a vaccine and then getting that vaccine out there um, and having, having uh, getting things uh, under control again. That's a really good point. And um, yeah, from my point of view, that's where brands can possibly help is with maybe learning and development and actually kind of supporting venues that can't invest in their own staff at the moment because yes. of the pressures on their revenues. So brands can help out. You know, it's probably going to be even more important for individuals given the lack of revenue to be more entrepreneurial and getting the best out of every single transaction, you know, spend per head, stock control, all of these things are even more important than ever. Yeah, especially if you've got part-time staff. I mean, I mean, it's not impossible for, I think, for, for a brand or a distributor to, to take someone on board one or two days a week. So they're essentially working full-time, but they're learning a different skill set. They could be learning about drinks, marketing, branding, that, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, you know, I think that, that's really valuable to, uh, to everyone in the industry. Yeah, I like that you're saying that because we already do most of those things uh, with our staff, which is really good. And, and, and we have quite good staff retention um, in an industry, like you say, which is notoriously bad. Um, and I, I think, you know, that there's a lot to be said for how all of this was handled um, at, at the beginning as well. And there were certain big companies who well and truly didn't care about their staff and, and messed a few people over at the start, which, you know, I hope isn't forgotten about moving forward because... Yeah. You know that that's there's other people who you know I've got I got two million pound loan uh, for for across some sites because we wanted to make sure that we could pay our staff we wanted to make sure we could do all of this and make sure everyone's right from day one not uh, sack them and then <laughs> reemploy them which was an absolute hideous thing that people did and they didn't care one bit about their staff um, I'm not going to mention any names I think we all know who they are um, and and I think you know. I wouldn't want to work for that company any longer. Um, so yeah, but keeping your staff is a really, really, really important thing, and it costs you money to reemploy people. Um, you should, you should always want to keep all your staff because you know they are the heart and soul of every business. Um, you know, recruitment is more expensive than retaining your staff. So oh, yeah. your investment today is going to pay dividends in the future. Yeah, right? absolutely. 
Okay, so we need to kind of move things on into the slightly longer term. Obviously, there's been some unanticipated positive outcomes of lockdown. So looking ahead for our industry, what are the long term implications? Do you think any of the changes that we've talked about will be more permanent? And if so, which ones? And is this a chance, as we've kind of intimated already, a chance for the industry to be better? And kind of in certain factors in terms of sustainability, maybe, or in learning and development, can we kind of have a restart? I think one of the things that I would really, really like to see um, is, again, kind of following on from what Linda said about looking after your staff. I think one thing that if I had my own business and um, or my own sort of like collection of bars or whatever, whatever it is, is um, I'd, I'd want to start creating something called like a relief fund for all your staff. And the, and the idea, idea behind, behind it would be, be to say, for example, example we can do with service charge, charge and you know, that, that a proportion of that service charge, charge goes into this relief fund, that then when something like this happens, we have that sort of backup to provide, you know, full payment for staff or to provide something. And it's one of those things you won't notice a small amount going going into this relief fund every single month. Um, but that's something that I would really like to see because, you know, without money, it's you can't you can't sort of survive. You can't sort of live. You know, people are barely getting through. You know, most people live paycheck to paycheck. You know, some people, you know, don't the money that they're getting from furlough isn't enough to pay their rent. So they're now living on the streets and it's the reality of it. I think as an industry, we get caught up in this bubble of awards and you know accolades and free drinks or this and it's just got too much i don't think like any venue now should be should be doing that i think we need to be properly investing in things that actually make a difference and planning for the future because if something like this does happen again and we're not prepared then we're stupider than we think we are you know what i mean it's just we need to be sort of investing in that i would like to see a really fun like you know obviously like the drinks trust have been amazing um but i'd like to see sort of companies owning this and preparing for if something like this does happen again because redundancies for example are inevitable you know companies have started doing this um and, and i'm sure a lot of us are going to be going through this as well and we need to be if we had this fund already we would be able to save people you know, and be able to give people security and lifetime loyalty to a company, because that's what's going to matter now. You know, you need to be that company that stands up. And, you know, it's times like this when I wish maybe, you know, I had my own business and I could do this. Um, but it's, I, hope, I hope that other people will be, will, be, will, will, be, will be able to do something similar to this, because it's, it's heartbreaking, you know. I think sort of long-term implications, you know, in the industry, we need to turn all of this into a positive even though it's a really shitty time, we need to make sure that the future is positive, not just for you know people like us who've been in the industry for ages, but the next generation as well. And invest if something like this does happen again, we have a plan. So I hope I hope that you know bigger companies will be able to start doing something like this. I I, I like your idea of uh, uh, getting rid of the awards for a bit. I think that would be really good. I'm bored of awards. I think we're all bored of awards. Yes. And the amount of money that that must take and cost to do those awards could be better spent now, much better spent. Um, you know, brand trips, things like this, you know, some of which are quite important and they're really good for knowledge, most of which are just a really good free trip and you get leathered. Um, you know, I, I think we could really, really, really do without those things and we could have that money from brands and different people who put the awards on and things to do something better for you know people across our industry um you know well across the world really isn't it if you cancel all of those things and uh i think everyone would be behind it as well yeah good I idea Anna. i think you know obviously with that it's you know that the awards and everything are people's jobs as well so i don't i don't want to sort of cause <laughs> cause the stuff because I'm it's it. i'm glad you're saying it not me <laughs> yeah, but I just think you know we need to look outside. It's so easy to get caught in this bubble sometimes, and yeah, sure, it's a great bubble sometimes. And like you said, you go on great trips and all of this, but we need to be thinking more strategically now, and we need to be putting those platforms to better use. And you know, we, for the next year, we need to be kind of going, well, what? How are we going to get back to surviving? You know, surviving this, thriving, hopefully through it all, um, and actually making a difference. There was this. Um, and you know, yeah, as companies, companies like, like really we need, need to be reevaluating re what our values are, what our mission statements are. And you know, so many I've done so many orientations, and the word family gets thrown about so much. 
but it's I've always said like you don't get to call yourself a family in the good times when you're sitting around having sharing platters of food and family star dinners you get to call yourself a family in the bad times like now when you know you're fighting for everybody to to survive you know it's 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 brutal and it's uh yeah it's something I feel really passionately about I think this lockdown has kind of really and I, I for me I found that I definitely had a much more positives than negatives come out of this and to reevaluate some of the things that I sort of believe in and I want to do for the future for this industry as well um so I think now's the chance and I think if you have a platform we all need to use it and I've heard some amazing stories coming out um from a certain pub company where they've not only obviously they're topping people up they're bringing people back they've implemented um a new system which was built specifically for coronavirus sort of like post-coronavirus like reservations and everything and it's just amazing to sort of see that and the other thing that they've done is they put all new openings on hold until this for the next year so they can keep on all their staff and that's amazing we need more people well, doing that. to open a new site uh, uh, very soon um, um, <laughs> unless, unless you were bored for three months and built one but um, yeah I, th I think uh, um, yeah I think definitely there is you know we've cancelled all of our reopenings but I, I think that was probably more out of necessity than uh, than, than anything else um, but you know I think it is time to get down and, and, and kind of concentrate on a lot more things you know um, you know, as as bar owners, I think people automatically assume as a bar owner you're doing it for the money and the this and you know. I, I think the money's always been a secondary or, or or probably less than secondary that I've always thought about. It's about you know putting something out there that people love. You know, that I'd, I'd rather have a happy customer walk out of my venue, uh, you know, and than than money in the bank from them. You know, it, it's. It is about concentrating on those things that are really, really important. And, you know, people's people just coming out and having a good time is really, really important. That's why we all do it. We do it mm -hmm. because people want to have fun and they want to let their hair down and commiserate or celebrate or do everything else in between. And, you know, it, concentrate on those things. Concentrate on those things that makes people's nights and days and evenings uh, better. And I think if we can do that, um, you know, we, we're... That, that's what we need to concentrate on, you know, and, and that's what gives us the revenue. You know, you don't worry about the money. You worry about that and the money will come. Yeah. Um, you worry about the money and then, well, you shouldn't be in the business. And there's positive byproducts to that as well, right? You know, these kind of creative venues like yours breathing life into a particular high street or a particular area and kind of inspiring the next Lyndon Higginson, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know about that. But, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great thing, Linda. Your your venues are, are. I've had so many fun nights there, and that's that's what we need. You know, that's I think the biggest thing about lockdowns. People have missed those moments, those nights, those days in a really really fun environment because it's, it's great sitting in a park, but you do get a bit bored about. Oh, you get a bit bored after a while. <laughs> For the foreseeable future, we're all going to be sat in pubs, aren't we? For the foreseeable future, we are sat down at a table, um, you know, and, and not dancing on the bar top with your top off. Um, I'm not saying that was you, Anna. Um, um, you know, I, I think, you know, we, I think we want to make sure, you know, that we, we get out of this quicker. And, and if we get out quicker, we can, well, our tops can be off again, you know. Um, Drew, anything to add in terms of the future? I know sustainability. Uh, leading on from, from tops off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. You know, we, we work in hospitality because we really enjoy it. We certainly don't do it for the money. When you start out, you earn minimum wage and work silly hours and um, and, and generally not favourable working conditions. Uh, they have improved somewhat, but it's certainly a time for reflection. As, uh, as Anna was saying, we, we, we've all... Uh, I think that this panel had, had time to reflect on things and uh, and work out how we can make things better for for ourselves and for the community. Um, uh, and we are a tight community. You know, there's a lot of us out there that are all you know, sort of nationally and then on a, on a local level. Uh, I think uh, that's something we are generally very good at with, with hospitality because it is all about the people. Um, whether it's your your peers or families, as uh, as it might be referred to, um, or the guests that come and enjoy your venue, and it, yeah, absolutely to reiterate what Lyndon's saying, you know, it, if you need to operate with, with that fact in mind, you want happy customers to leave because 
otherwise it really is it's it's pointless and there's no longevity in that and there's no fun i think that's a nice positive note to end on so thanks very much for watching this session today part of Invive live online supported by medtel sentia i'd like to once again thank our guest Lyndon. thank you drew thanks very much and anna thank you so much everyone all sessions will be available to watch on demand after the show don't forget there are plenty more sessions to come across the next two days so make sure you check out the rest of the program up now on instagram live is an interview with the drinkers trust on accessing health and wellness services and back here at 3.30 p.m. is a panel on a Taste of the UK, a showcase of UK drinks and how to make the best of local producers. Thanks again and goodbye. Cheers, guys. Thank you for Bye. watching. Take it easy. Bye. See you later. <laughs>